uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I apologize for my voice. I'm trying to recover from a cold. Um, today, you heard about batteries and energy generation. I'm going to switch the topic a little bit to talk about our biological batteries, mitochondria. And they play a critical role uh, in energy generation. And um, this is the main focus of my lab. So what I will do, uh, it's been about three years since I started my lab here, that, here at UCSD. I will talk about my research program and how um, funding from uh, Garden and Bittimore Foundation and Research Corporation and being a Sciolog Fellow is influencing my um, future career. I'll talk about that. Um, so I said the uh, powerhouse of the mind is um, mitochondria and we're interested in how neurons actually regulate mitochondria overall. Uh, because although mitochondria are important for every cell type, in the nervous system, they, they have particular importance because even though our brain takes up about 2% of our body mass, 20% of the energy is being used by the brain, and 95% of this energy is actually generated by mitochondria. And it, there are many neurodegenerative disorders develop when mitochondria progressively fails. This is an image of single brain section of mouse uh, motor cortex, and every pink dot here is mitochondria, and if I try to show the whole brain, it's just going to be covered in pink, basically. Our brain is literally packed by mitochondria because they're that essential. And um, why we're interested in why neurons are uh, particularly unique, in addition to all these energy needs, they also have very unique challenges because unlike many cells, neurons are really, really, really huge. An example is in dopamine neurons. In the human brain, uh, the neuron size is estimated to be 4.5 meters. If you add up all the axonal branches, that's a half bit of this wall. We're talking about a cell that big. And the energy demand, single synapse requires about my, 1 million ATP, that's the biological form of energy. And then in dopamine neurons, again, this long neuron, there are over 1 million uh, synapse. So you make the calculations of overall ATP need. We're talking about huge energy demand. And in addition to this, there are logistical problems, right? So if you look at this neuron, uh, they're projecting from one brain region to another, and these elaborate uh, axonal branches. Uh, and here's an example. We grow these neurons in a culture and then stain their mitochondria. And you can imagine Every branch here is labeled with this red mitochondria, and you can see here. So they're, uh, they're everywhere, and they're also motile. You can see they're moving. Some of them are stationary. Some, are, some of them are moving one direction or the other. But we still don't understand how do they know where to go, how do they know where to stop, and mitochondria carry out many functions. So how do they know which function to carry out based on the state of that neuron or the particular need of that neuronal function? So these are the main focuses of my lab. And, um, and this is a complex problem because, as you can imagine, these axons, they're like long, long roads. But the road is not empty. It's crowded. It, there are constant signals coming from everywhere. So how do mitochondria filter these signals and, uh, and then respond by changing its motility? And motility is also important for maintaining healthy mitochondria pool. So these are some of the problems that we're addressing in my lab. And in addition to that, mitochondria needs nutrients to generate ATP. And the main food for brain is glucose. So glucose gets taken up. And it has to go through all these additional metabolic pathways, and not only glucose, of course, other, other nutrients. And somehow, uh, these metabolic pathways need to be communicated to mitochondria because that's going to be the final energy output. So what do we know about this? How we can take all this complex metabolic biochemistry and place in the neuron uh, that has over 4.5 meter long uh, cell length. So these are really big challenges, and we're trying to develop ideas and tools and, uh, uh, and discover molecular pathways regulating this crosstalk. And that's when this was the uh, first year of my position here at UCSD. And I remember getting this email from Bill McGuinness, a former biology dean, about uh, chemical machinery of the cell and cellulog. And what was really impressive, the first two questions they said they want to discuss in the cellulog 
um, how does the cell organize reaction in functionally distinct compartments? That was exactly what I was trying to get. And then the second, how do molecules move through the dense cytoplasm of the cell so the reactions are not limited by passive diffusion? That's really important in neurons because you cannot rely on passive diffusion if you need millions of ATP per millisecond. So that's when I, I, when I got really excited about and Bill nominated me and I became Cyolog Fellow. And I have to admit, Cyolog experience is really unique. When we're discussing all these scientific problems, we always say it's never, never land for scientists because you have no limit. You just discuss all your ideas. You don't have to think about funding. You don't have to think about uh, disease relevance or you don't have to think about how you're going to structure the grant. It's just really never, never land for scientists. So when we were in that hotel in Arizona, we were just so happy because it's the pure joy of being scientists. And while we were going through our discussions, I was fortunate enough to be paired up with these two uh, scientists, Abhishek Chaturja. Uh, he's at uh, Boston College, and his uh, main focus is chemical and synthetic biology. He designed a lot of tools. And then Juan Perilla, who is at University of Delaware, and his expertise is computational biophysics. And of course, I start talking about mitochondrial motility in neurons, this crowded environment. And immediately, we start making this uh, analogy between bacteria and mitochondria. And bacteria are the distant relatives of mitochondria, right? And uh, this, was, um, this was actually uh, one of the first time I thought about the similarities, and now I'm going to show you a movie oops, of uh, bacteria, uh, bacterial chemotaxis to sugar crystal. So this is a very well described uh, unicellular uh, behavior, and um, and for for chemotaxis to occur, bacteria constantly has to sense the uh, chemical environment and establish some sort of memory and compare so the so the chemotaxis can occur towards that in that case sugar molecule. So now I'm going to show you motility of uh, mitochondria in single neuron. You can see they're also moving back and forth, but we don't know what they're sensing regularly. And we decide to write a grant about finding mitochondrial memory. What if, uh, what if, um, oops, what if mitochondria has a memory similar to bacteria and constantly sensing extracellular, uh, um, in this case, cytoplasmic signals, and comparing uh, and then making the move based on this, uh, uh, this signal? Then we all start asking these questions. What are the mitomodulatory signal that really energy or nutrient level information? Can we predict mitochondrial behavior with computational microscopy? Because we also didn't have the tools to start making this complex um, uh, image analysis. And then finally, do mitochondria have memory? So what we decided to do, uh, first, we need to have a reduced system where we can control the environment. And this is where Abhishek came in and he said, okay, you know, we can, do, we can generate light-controlled ATP sync. So we can reduce the ATP in small portion of neurons so we can, we can watch mitochondrial behavior. And not only in a small portion of an axon, we can actually do this analysis in a whole neuron using this uh, data-guided deep learning-based um, network modeling and in a way use computer vision. So this is what we're optimizing right now and tool development is in the works. And Juan and I am constantly going back and forth between our movies and we have some exciting algorithms that we're optimizing. And how this influenced my research is we were talking about mitomodulatory signals and optimizing these analysis techniques. We are also doing a lot of proteomics in my lab now, changing nutrient availability. For example, glucose versus ketone bodies. Our brain, they go through these changes regularly. And what we see, mitochondria adapts because there is no, there is no time to think about, okay, what is going to be the nutrient? What is the source? So if it's ketone body, immediately changes. If it's glucose, and and what we're doing now is we are proteomically mapping these modulatory signals, which seems to be mostly post-translational regulated. We are also analyzing overall mitochondrial behavior with the tools that Juan is um, uh, generating. 
And I can also say our proteomics analysis is indicating this really intricate connection between mitochondria and other organelles, as if like it's almost there's a sync button. The moment nutrient change, the whole intercellular uh, network is adapting and we're trying to, in a way, understand the code. What if there is some kind of um, sync button or uh, overall synchronization happening constantly and it's basically initiated based on the metabolic state of a neuron. And we are really excited about it and we're also writing NSF grant. And I was fortunate enough to get one more, <laughs> one more project support um, from, uh, from our Sciolog meetings. And that was, uh, that was me being teamed up with Marquita uh, Landry, she's at UC Berkeley, and Jan Preshner at UC Irvine, we call the UC Dream Team. And uh, because we're also aiming for this UC uh, cross-campus grants now that's coming up in the spring. And uh, what we thought, um, what we need to really understand how brain functions in, and how nervous system communicates and how mitochondria supports all these different needs at the synapse, we need tools. But right now, most of the tools, in, uh, I can say these are genetically encoded sensors, they require this very invasive uh, technique, so mostly uh, implantation of this cranial window for brain imaging. But Jan's lab, they've been working with these luciferase-based sensors, and one of the version has been recently shown in a marmoset brain that you can actually use these sensors in vivo, in intact brain, and image through skull. So we decided, what if we can take these sensors, generate split versions, and then this is going to be a platform for us to start detecting monoamines, neurotransmitters, ATP, you name it. So this is basically a general tool. And so we're working on this. Jan, Jan's lab was successfully able to split these um, luciferase reporters. We're, con con we're continuously changing the, uh, the overall efficiency and the signal that we can get. And she's doing a lot of um, mutations to get better constructs. And in my lab, yeah, so this is one of the main problem right now. But in my lab, we're also doing a lot of cell-based analysis uh, because we realize we can also use these sensors for ATP, uh, ATP imaging. You can see, you can see uh, this is a neuron. You can see the overall ATP level in soma, but in processes, they're very weak. Well, we are also optimizing with Jan's uh, constructs, targeting these on different portions of mitochondria or, or neuron, so we can, we can also use these sensors to measure overall ATP level. And at the end, uh, both intracellularly and extracellularly, our goal is to really start looking at these neuronal messengers by using these new generation of sensors. And we are, uh, we are currently working on um, Brain Initiative grant, they want tools, so we're obviously going to apply for it, and also cross uh, UC uh, campus grants. Uh, with that, I'd like to take my, uh, thank my lab, and again, uh, Research Corporation and Gordon and Bittermore Foundation for supporting our research, because this wasn't only important to get all these ideas and some seed money, I also have to emphasize this. As a junior fellow, we talked about imposter sy syndrome, right? When you have these crazy ideas, you always think, oh, you know, this doesn't make sense. I'm never going to get this work, and nobody is going to believe me. But getting that seed funding and support and thinking that your ideas are actually valuable, and you can take these ideas and kind of open up new directions were really important. And it really helped me to gain confidence in my ideas. So thank you for supporting us. And I'm happy to take more questions. The short answer is there are so many. And most of the mitochondrial disorders either caused by mutations in the mitochondrial genome or nuclear genome that encodes mitochondrial proteins, um, they cause um, many neurodegenerative diseases because brain always have enhanced penetration. But uh, one of the focus in my lab is dopamine neurons. It's known that uh, one of the underlying um, 
because of familiar form of Parkinson's disease is in fact a mitochondrial protein. So we're still trying to understand when you mutate that protein, it has enhanced phenotype in dopamine neurons and what makes that particular neuron subclass vulnerable. So there is definitely neurodegenerative phenotype, but even within, within neuron subclass, depending on which mutation, there is, there is neuron type specific selectivity and we don't understand why. Okay, thank you.